Hello and welcome to the latest Moneymakers Weekly Investment Trust podcast. I'm Jonathan Davis, the editor of the Investment Trust Handbook and your host for this weekly review of all the latest news and developments affecting the investment trust sector. My thanks to JP Morgan Asset Management for agreeing to sponsor the podcast, which as a result will now remain free for the foreseeable future. Moneymakers is an independent research and publishing venture with a mission to explain and inform. But I must remind you that for regulatory reasons, nothing you hear from any speaker today should be regarded as constituting individual investment advice. Remember also that past performance, while relevant, is not a reliable guide to future performance. This week, I'm joined by two experienced managers of trust with a global perspective. The first is Joe Baunfraund, manager of the AVI Global Trust, ticker AGT, which many of you may remember as the former British Empire Securities. It specialises in looking for deep discount opportunities in three main areas. Large holding companies, often family owned, Japanese smaller companies uh, and UK investment trusts. The latter on this occasion being the subject of our conversation. My second discussion this week is with Evie Hambro, who has been involved in the running of BlackRock World Mining Trust, ticker BRWM, since its launch 30 years ago. And the last 14 of them, he's been the lead investment manager. We discuss the outlook for commodities and the trust's dividend and growth potential. The markets this week continue to fixate on inflation and interest rates, with bond yields in the US, Europe and the UK continuing to rise, reaching their highest levels yet in the current cycle uh, in many cases during the week, before a late rally on Friday after some generally encouraging US and European inflation data releases. Oil, meanwhile, ended the week around $90 a barrel. It's been up sharply over the last couple of months, with copper also showing a slight gain. But gold has fallen back below the $1,900 an ounce mark. Equity market indices were generally in retreat, with only China showing a small positive gain. The S&P 500 was down three quarters of 1%, the FTSE down a full 1%, and the All Share Index uh, 1.1% down, while the 250 index, the mid-cap index, was 1.7% down, which was similar in turn to the decline we saw in the Japanese market this week. The Investment Trust Index, which measures the performance of 180 of the trusts in the FTSE All Share Index, was down 1.75% as well, with the average discount widening a little further to a little over 16%. The index now is down about 5% year to date before taking account of dividends. Digital 9 infrastructure was the biggest loser of the week, down 30% after shelving its dividend and Property trusts were also notably in retreat. At the other end of the performance tables, Downing Renewables was the biggest gainer, up a short 6%, while a number of debt, smaller company and renewable trusts also made modest gains. Turning to the news, there was a positive avalanche of trust results announcements this week, uh, most of them interim results covering the half year to the end of June. Too many by far to cover them all in this week's podcast, although I will highlight some of the bigger trust names. As usual, subscribers to the Moneymakers Circle, our subscription offering, will find a full list of all the relevant stock exchange announcements this week, together with links to the details, plus our normal table of the biggest movers in share price, NAV and discount terms over both the week and year to date. This week's uh, in-depth trust profile, by coincidence, also features BlackRock World Mining, while next week it will be the turn of Templeton Emerging Markets, to experience the careful scrutiny of my colleague, Stuart Watson, who writes these in-depth profiles. On the news front, there were further developments at three of the trusts which have recently been in the news for the wrong reasons, but are looking to right their past problems. At Home REIT, ticker H-O-M-E, the Homeless Accommodation Trust, whose shares have been suspended since January, the company announced that the new investment manager, AEW, has sold... 137 properties, about 5.6% of the total, in a series of public auctions, raising £23 million. But that, however, is only equivalent to 32% of their purchase price. So being sold at a big discount. Uh, This is the second sale of properties at a wide discount that has happened since the new regime was put in place. AEW has also identified a significant number of properties, which it says are in poor condition, most of those being vacant and requiring significant capital expenditure to bring them up to scratch. 
This noted one of the broker's analysts this week will only tend to confirm investor suspicions that the valuations of this trust had been artificially inflated. And the fact that such a large number of properties were found to be in poor condition clearly reflects poorly on the previous investment management and casts some doubt over its promises that this investment uh, strategy would deliver a significant measure of social good by funding accommodation for the homeless. No news, though, on when the shares might come back from suspension. Over at Thomas Lloyd Energy Impact, ticker TLEI, whose shares are also suspended, we learnt the results of the latest general meeting called by affiliates of the outgoing investment manager, who were seeking to have the board removed and replaced. This vote did not pass, with 58.2% of the shareholders backing the board and 41% voting to remove it. The question now obviously remains where this company goes next, as shareholders have opted to keep the trust going for now. They like its Asian sustainable energy focus, but the trust still faces the challenge of sorting out the issues that have delayed its results and caused the suspension of its shares. There's also, of course, the risk that those who voted for the board change may now want to exit, leaving question marks about whether the trust is sufficiently large to be viable. Meanwhile, though, the board has agreed heads of terms with Octopus Renewables to appoint Octopus Energy Generation as the company's, I quote, transitional investment manager until the end of April next year, for which they'll receive a fixed fee of $1.35 million uh, with a discretionary performance fee of half a million dollars or so. That dependent on them meeting a number of conditions, not least being able to complete the uh, results of this trust and allow the shares to come back from suspension. Meanwhile, at Song, Hypnosis Song's Fund, the drama there continues. The trust has published a circular setting out the details of the proposals it first announced on the 14th of September, aimed to uh, reduce the wide discount that the trust has been trading at. Uh, They've named the date for the uh, extraordinary general meeting at which these proposals will be voted on, Uh, And that will be the same day that the Trust puts forward its continuation vote, which will determine whether or not shareholders want the Trust to continue in its present form. The the initial proposals have been slightly refined since as a result of shareholder consultations. Uh, Meanwhile, the Trust has also announced that the chairman, Andrew Such, will be stepping down as chairman and retiring from the board once a suitable replacement has been found. A second director, Andrew Wilkinson, has also said that he intends to retire before the end of this year. So new directors there will be needed if the trust is to continue. The investment advisor agreement with Hypnosis Songs Management has been amended as part of these uh, tinkering with the proposals first announced earlier this month, and they will now include a 12-month notice for termination. The board says that a number of, quote, credible parties have been engaged in the go shop process, uh, which is intended to find out if there are any alternatives to Blackstone, the related party that works with the hypnosis song management, to come forward with a better offer for the 20% of the music royalties catalogues that the company is proposing to put up for sale. So that one still is in the balance Next, let's talk about Digital 9 Infrastructure, ticker DGI9, which, as I said earlier, was the main share price faller this week in the investment trust universe. Uh, It shares falling 30% to just 30p, which is uh, well below the issue price and a 60% discount to its latest NAV. Uh, The trust reported its latest interim figures for the first half of the year, which were disappointing with the NAV down 8.8% and the total return including dividends, minus 5.6%. And this despite the fact that the weighted average discount rate was actually reduced from 12.6% to 11.8%. The discount rate being the rate at which the future cash flows of this trust are discounted in order to arrive at the latest NAV. The big disappointment here, though, was clearly the decision by the board to say that it's not going to declare a second quarter 2023 dividend and it's withdrawing its target of 6% dividend per share, even though that dividend target had been reiterated as recently as the middle of July this year. Uh, Markets never take kindly to dividends being cut unexpectedly. The board now says it's going to consult with shareholders to determine the optimal future dividend policy, and indeed the direction of the company. In the short term, the immediate challenge is for the company to complete the syndication 
of its holding in the Verne Global Group, one of its largest assets. On a more positive note, uh, we heard from a number of private equity trusts which have completed realizations, which they will uh, point to as being evidence that the net asset values of these trusts are reliable indicators of the value in the portfolio. HG, the manager of HG Capital Trust, uh, ticker HGT, has agreed the sale of its investment in Silverfin, a cloud platform for accountants. The transaction values it at uh, 18.8 million a 20% uplift to the 31 August carrying value. This is latest of a series of realizations from HG Capital Trust, all of them having been at significant uplifts to their carrying value. In a similar vein, Hickel at Hickel Infrastructure, ticker HICL, announced the disposal of a portfolio of five UK assets to John Lang, another infrastructure company, for 204 million which represents a small premium to its 31st March valuation for these assets, which comprise an entire equity interest in four UK public-to-private projects, including my local hospital, Oxford John Radcliffe Hospital, as it happens. The proceeds will be used to further pay down the drawn balance on the fund's revolving credit facility to around £130 This announced to total asset sales of over £300 since the 31st of March which the board says demonstrates the management's commitment to proactive capital management in the current environment. Uh, The shares, however, remain trading on a discount of around 20%. Uh, Pantheon International, another of the larger private equity trusts, ticker PIN, has also made a, a further announcement about its plans to tackle its persistent discount. It says that in addition to the £200 million buyback programme last month, it's also going to be offering as an alternative a tender offer to shareholders. The tender offer share price will be determined by demand, but uh, will be somewhere between 280p and 315p, which compares with the current share price of 292p. The discount here has come in since the announcement of the big share buyback programme, but they're offering this alternative of a tender as well will also help the shares, which were up a little bit this week, and trade on a discount of now in the mid-30s rather than the earlier level of well over 40%. Turning to annual results, of which there were a number this week, the best announcement probably came from the Gulf Investment Fund, ticket GIF, which is a relatively small fund that invests in companies uh, listed in the Gulf area. That reported NAV total return of positive 20.3% against a 2.1% decline in its index. Also reporting a much larger trust, JP Morgan Global Growth and Income, JGGI, a market cap of $1.9 billion, which, as you will recall, over the course of the last couple of years, has grown significantly on the back of its acquisitions of the assets of Scottish Investment Trust and JP Morgan Elect. It reported a NAV total return of 19.1% against 11.3% increase in its benchmark. It's confirmed its dividend at 17p, which is consistent in line with its 4% target. This is one of the trusts that operates an enhanced income policy where it pays out a fixed percentage of 4% of its NAV at its uh, dividend election dates. Also reporting positive and outperformance in its latest annual results is Strategic Equity Capital, ticker SEC, which reported NAV total return 9.2% for its latest annual period against a 0.4% decline in its benchmark. This is a smaller company's UK equity investment trust. Reporting a positive period for outperformance was Schroeder Japan Trust, ticker SJG, which reported NAV total return of 11.7% against 9.4% gain for its index. And also worth mentioning Manchester in London, an interesting specialist investment trust, ticker MNL, which reported NAV total return of 15.3% versus a 5.1% gain in its benchmark. This is a trust that uh, invests heavily in technology shares and has therefore benefited from the strength of tech over the first nine months of this year. Results would have been even better if had it not been for the movement in sterling over this period, which reduced the gain by 5.5%. Others reporting annual results included JP Morgan Emerging Markets, ticker JMG, where the NAV total return was effectively zero, 
which at least was an improvement on the 2.8% decline in the MSCI Emerging Markets Index. And the European Opportunities Trust, ticker EOT, which reported NAV total return of 3.3%, mildly behind its 6.9% benchmark. And Tufton Oceanic Assets, ticker SHIP, the ship leasing company, which reported NAV per share more disappointing, down 5.8%, though the NAV total return was uh, minus 0.3% after taking account of the dividend. Ship has actually raised its dividend target for this year from uh, $0.08 cents to $0.85 cents and said it will be holding a continuation vote in 2024. Dividend yield on this one is around 8.7% and it trades at a discount of something in the region of 30%. Then turning to these interim results, as I say, no space to uh, cover them all. So I'm going to concentrate quickly on a number that have reported uh, notably positive outperformance over their latest six months periods and mention the ones with the biggest disappointments. On the positive front, we have Henderson Eurotrust, ticker HNE, which reported a NEV total return of 16.7% for the year to the 31st of July, outperforming its benchmark index by a very small, modest 0.6%. Fair Oaks Income, ticker FAIR, reported a NAV total return of 9% for the six months to the end of 30th June in this case. Uh, and Martin Curry Global Portfolio, ticker MNP, where the NAV total return was 8.9% against its global benchmark, which was up 5.5%. Also making a positive return were Blackstone Loan Financing, ticker BGLF, up total return 2.2%. Uh, this one is in managed wind down, like a number of other debt trusts. And Biopharma Credit, which is a direct loan investment trust, ticker BPCR, which has had a number of difficulties with one of its largest uh, loans with a company called Yumira DX and has been forced to amend that agreement several times, an action which has prompted the shares to move out to a significant discount. But it actually reported an increase in its NAV for the six month period of around 1%. It has reaffirmed, though, its 7% dividend target, uh, which gives it a prospective dividend yield of around 8.5%. A trust reporting more disappointing figures in their latest interim results uh, included Third Point Investors, ticker TPOU, the investment trust managed by the US hedge fund manager Dan Loeb. It reported an NAV total return of minus 3.8%, which is certainly a disappointing result in a period when both the MSC World Index and the S&P 500 reported uh, significant gains of around 15%. Third point investors was underweight in the big tech stocks that have driven uh, market performance in the US this year. This company also announced that its affiliated director Josh Targoff uh, will not be put forward as a director in 2024 following a 20% vote against his appointment at the most recent general meeting. So that will make the board completely independent, which has not been until now. Also reporting interim results, Merchants Trust, ticker MRCH, the UK Equity Income Trust, which reported NAV total return of minus 2.3% compared to a 0.8% increase for the FTSE All Share Index over the same period. The company attributed the modest underperformance to stock selection and pointed out that the fund has delivered a positive NAV total return over the last three, five and ten years. More than mild disappointment for Phoenix Spree Deutschland, the German uh, property trust which reported an NAV total return of minus nine percent for its latest six-month period. And there were disappointment too for shareholders in Bailey Gifford Shin Nippon, ticker BGS, the Japanese Smaller Companies Trust, which reported an NAV decline of 9.7% which compared to a 1.1% rise in the MSCI Japan Small Cap Index. And also for Schroeder's Capital Growth Innovation Trust, ticker INOV, which many of you may remember as the old Woodford Patient Capital Trust, uh, that reported an NAV total return of minus 13.3% for its latest six-month period. And then there we have also had a series of interim results and updates from Infrastructure Trusts, Bluefield Solar, U.S. Solar, Gresham House Energy Storage and Aquila Energy Efficiency Trust and similarly updates from a number of other alternative asset trusts including MB Private Equity, Pantheon Infrastructure, GCP Asset Backed Income, 
and in the property sector, UK Commercial Property Trust, ticker UKCM, and Aberdeen Property Income, ticker API. On then to my discussion with Joe Boyenfreund, the manager of AVI Global Trust, ticker AGT, which, as I mentioned earlier, looks for discount opportunities in global markets, principally in three main areas. Uh, Holding companies, often family controlled, which often trade at a discount, but where there may be scope for re-rating. In Japanese smaller companies, where the trust is hoping to ride the wave of improved corporate governance in Japan, uh, which has prompted a number of companies to adopt more shareholder-friendly policies. Uh, And in the UK listed investment trust universe. Uh, For this discussion, I concentrated on what he has been doing in the UK investment trust space. Uh, AVI Global, I should add, is a large investment trust, has a market cap of just south of 1 billion and has been managed by uh, Joe since 2015. Uh, It has also trades at a discount, so shareholders do have the option by buying the shares of getting a discount on a trust which itself Uh, has a portfolio which trades on a significant discount, something close to 30%, according to the trust manager. You've been adding to some holdings in the UK investment trust sector, the closed-end world in the UK. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what you've been doing there and and why this is a discount opportunity, essentially? Absolutely. So, as I said, we have a long uh, history of investing uh, within the sector. Uh, It's fair to say that uh, over the past four or five years, we have been reducing our exposure to uh, investment trusts, particularly as discounts disappeared and premia emerged in in some areas of the market. But clearly, with the market volatility that we've experienced over the past 18 months, discounts have been emerging again. And in some cases, those discounts have been extremely wide. For us in particular, when we look at the listed private equity sector and some parts of the venture capital sector, discounts appear to be anomalously wide or unjustifiably wide. And that's because, you know, we think investors are reading across from previous years of crisis, 2008, 2009 in particular, and assuming that the same problems are going to hit the sector again. And so we do find an overreaction in terms of the share price falls that we've seen. We see a lot of skepticism about discounts, which we think is not matched when you look at what's going on in the the secondary market nor when you see some of the realizations coming through from uh, some of the private equity investors. So we think there's value in areas of that sector. And and our approach has been over the past year or so to build a basket approach initially, take stakes in half a dozen, a few more different stakes, relatively small in the context of AGT. And as time progresses, we have taken profits in some of the smaller ones, and add it to some of the higher conviction ones. And we've got some chunky holdings in a couple of them right now. The couple you've been adding to are specifically Princess Private Equity and uh, Pantheon International. They obviously have been on very wide discounts. And in the case of Princess Private Equity, they had a, a bit of a glitch with their dividend in last year. So why those two rather than some others? Well, for us, it's a combination of factors. We also own, I should say, Oakley Capital which is one of our largest positions in the trust. It's not a fund of funds. It's more a direct investor. In general, we're looking for good quality businesses trading at discounts. In something like Oakley, where we've got transparency into the underlying portfolio, we can do valuations of those underlying assets. It's quite a concentrated portfolio. And we can take a view on those and compare those to where they're trading, look at the discount and see whether it's interesting. In a fund of funds, it's more about general valuation trends, as I said at the start and also about engagement with the board and what we think the prospects are for the board to take action to narrow the discount. And when we talk about engaging with boards, it's typically done in a private, constructive way rather than a hostile, aggressive way. And in the case of Pantheon, you can see over the last few days, some of the outcomes of those discussions with the announced share buyback and tender offer, all of which we think is um, tremendously valuable to shareholders and absolutely the right thing to do and sets the level for other investment trusts in the sector to follow. Right. And in the case of Pantheon, as you said, we saw, first of all, an announcement they were going to put more of a sort of blunderbuss of share buybacks rather than modest tinkering. And then they've come out with this alternative of a tender Mm -hmm. offer as well. Obviously, your belief is that that's going to have an impact on the discount over a period of time. How long do you think it might take to get back? And what sort of level do you think these things should, in a steady state world, be trading at? 
Look, I've been active in this sector for long enough to know that predicting when discounts are going to disappear or what's going to happen to discounts is a fool's game. So I think in the meantime, it is the right thing to do. It's to demonstrate to the market that the board and the manager believe there's value in the portfolio. Buying shares on such a wide discount is accretive to the NAV and arguably the best investment that the trust can make given where the discounts are. So we think it's a good thing to do. We think it will have an impact on discounts as to how long it will take for those discounts to normalize. That's difficult to judge. Right. It's not going to happen overnight. These private equity trusts have traded at a discount in most cases, not all, for quite a long time. So is it actually realistic to expect them to get back to par at any point? Or It's, it's not necessarily our expectation that they should trade at par. When we've been buying trusts on 40%, in some cases even wider than that, discounts, for us, it's about taking advantage of extreme moves in discounts and benefiting as they narrow. We certainly don't argue that they should trade at premium to NAV or perhaps even at NAV. Some element of discount may be justified given the cost structure of some of these funds, but it's got to be a lot closer to 10% than to 50%. There has been a lot of discussion about enforced cost disclosure by wealth managers and so on. Some of the buyers who would naturally be involved in backing these kind of trusts. How important do you think that actually has been as a factor in producing these discounts and perhaps limiting the scope for re-rating? Well, I think it is an important factor in understanding partially what's going on in the sector. When you have a swathe of the investor base restricted or prevented in some cases from buying those trusts due to the artificial cost reporting requirements that, that are being imposed upon them, then discounts, when you think about it, is a mismatch in supply and demand. And, and if a, a chunk of the demand is removed from the market, then that creates pressure on the discount. So I think it, it has been a problem for the sector to grapple with, absolutely. Just looking at, again at some of your more recent moves, I've noticed that you have reduced your holdings in Pershing Square Holdings and Third Point Investors, both of these managed by US fund managers. Tell us a story of those two. Well, the first thing to say about Pershing Square is that we think of this almost like a family controlled holding company. Bill Ackman and his colleagues are very large shareholders in the trust, they're the largest shareholders. And any thoughts of forcing them by way of shareholder activism to do things that they don't want to do is unlikely to be successful. So we've long believed that this is more of an alignment of interest with a high quality investor. And importantly, what keeps us as shareholders is a view on the underlying portfolio. It's a very concentrated portfolio. There are five or six key investments in there. In particular, I'd highlight Universal Music being the largest investment in their portfolio and a company that we know extremely well and are highly confident about the prospects of that business. So we want to own that business. And in general, therefore, what we see with Pershing Square is an opportunity to own a collection of high quality businesses at very attractive valuations on a 35 to 40% discount approximately. Alongside which we've also benefited as shareholders from the derivative or hedging activities that have been employed which we find appealing given that they're risking very limited amounts of capital in return for high asymmetric returns, which we think is a very sensible and um, clever way to go about this. So for now, when we look at the NAV side of the equation, we find it appealing. And when we add the discount level, that makes it doubly appealing. And that's why we retain a sizable investment within Pershing Square. Do they have a, a discount problem? In a sense, yes, they've been doing the right thing, they've, they've been buying back shares. Arguably, they could be buying back more shares, but they have been buying back shares. They've been transparent. They've been putting more effort into their marketing activities and, and telling the story. And on top of that, the stars have aligned for them with very strong uh, performance over the last few years. So we find the discount anomalous in that context and uh, think it ought to be trading at a narrower discount. Though I'd echo the same comments I made a moment ago about the, the listed private equity trust is by no means our contention that this should trade anywhere near uh, NAV, but certainly at the levels that it's at at the moment, it is extremely wide. Do you think that their flirtation with SPACs and now with Sparks, you had mentioned that, is that something which you think is a positive in that one? We don't ascribe any value to it. It's a bit of noise, a bit of a distraction. And as I said at the start, the real value really is in the core portfolio, which is our main focus here. Okay. And as far as third point, uh, is it because a slightly different story? It is a slightly different story. That's right. We did employ a more public activist campaign a couple of years back in this one. Here, the performance has been more disappointing. 
And the company has been, as a result of our interaction, we think, taking action to, to narrow the discount. So there was an opportunity for shareholders to move part of their investment out of the investment trust into the open-ended fund and to redeem those periodically, which we've been taking advantage of. We still re- retain a smaller stake in, in the investment trust. And um, we'll see what happens in coming months as they reach a key date when they have to look at how the discount's been behaving and what happens then. Okay. And just looking across the UK investment trust sector, generally, you are finding more opportunities there. There are lots of things trading on big discounts, obviously. Have you been and will you be increasing your exposure to this particular universe at the moment, apart from the names we just mentioned? Well, as you said, we have been increasing. We're constantly looking for opportunities. Bear in mind that within AGT, we want to run a fairly concentrated portfolio and not looking for large number of tail positions. And with opportunities cropping up across our universe, across the world, there's limited capital available right now to add or to initiate substantial new holdings. But we monitor this on an ongoing basis and compare opportunities within the investment trust sector to other opportunities. And it's really a combination of opportunities and available capital. So quite possibly. So in other words, there might be some things that you think would be of interest, but they may not be big enough to move the dial or they may not fit into your overall uh, perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And if we have a toehold position at some point, maybe they have an opportunity to increase them and, and build them from there. So yes, we definitely are looking at the sector. Yeah, my general point being, I suppose you've been following this sector, been involved in this sector for a long time. Discounts have got very wide. There are going to be more consolidation, presumably. Boards will be taking a more active approach. We've seen that. Do you think they've been doing enough uh, so far, taking the universe as a whole from what you've seen? Well, I think discounts will tell you that they haven't been doing enough and there's more to do. Okay, so then let's just take a step back finally and look at AVI Global Trust itself. I think your argument is that basically everything you own is at a discount and the shares in uh, your trust as well are at discount. So you're getting effectively a discount on a discount. And I think you've estimated that to be at one point around 40%. You must feel pretty confident that that is an attractive opportunity. I should ask you then, what could go wrong? Yeah, well, you know, I think the environment, as we said, is very interesting for fundamental stock pickers like us. And as we've seen over the last few months, companies are doing more in terms of implementing measures to correct their discounts, correct their undervaluation. So we think it's an interesting time. But equity markets remain tricky. There's a lot of risk aversion around. We know that large swathes of investors here in the UK are taking money out of equity funds and putting them into gilts at 5 or 6% and thinking that's a good return. And discounts, for as long as investor interest in companies remains elusive, discounts could remain. So I think some of the risks to the downside for us are that these discounts persist and equity markets remain difficult and we don't make much headway. But that's why really we're trying to position uh, our portfolio more actively into situations where there are catalysts for unlocking the value, whether it's ourselves in Japan being the shareholder activist pushing companies to do more, whether it's companies like Shipstead where management are taking the action to correct the discounts. And really the focus of our activity the past year has been position ourselves where something's likely to happen rather than passively wait for discounts to normalize because that may not happen in the very near term. And the question then that follows is, your shares are trading a discount. What can you do to uh, reduce that discount? And then perhaps related to that tangentially is, what are you doing with your gearing? So we have been buying back more shares this year than we've done um, the previous few years. I think it's running uh, somewhere around 6 or 7% on an annual basis currently. As you say, we do see value in our shares. We think the discount is anomalously wide. And we think the right thing to do is to buy more of our portfolio on a 10 11% discount which is where it's at at the moment. I think that the discount level is wide, but we're not alone in suffering from a wider than expected or anticipated discount. Discounts have been afflicting the sector quite extremely the past year, year and a half. And we've seen some of our peers trading at discounts approaching 20%. So as I say, the right thing is to buy back shares and to keep going if we see discounts where they are at the moment. In terms of our own gearing, the gearing has gone up over the last year. It reflects the fact that we stated quite quite early on in the year that we were seeing more opportunities than we have done across the board, across the range of our universe. And our approach to that is if we see opportunities, if if we're excited about companies, then we should own them and we shouldn't worry about market timing and worry about holding cash. We should utilize the gearing that's available to us. We were fortunate to take out some gearing in the past year in Japanese yen at very, very low levels. That gives us an advantage and... uh, 
It's an attractive use of the tools in our armory, really, to, to maintain a geared position. My first question then, when I caught up with Evie Hambro, the manager of the BlackRock World Mining Trust, was to ask him whether what's happened this year has uh, come as a surprise to him. We started the year with a lot of talk about China reopening, and that was going to be positive for the commodity sector as well as the world economy. But it hasn't quite worked out like that so far this year, has it, uh, Evie? Yeah, well, thank you very much for having me on. It's the first thing to say. I th- and it's a great pleasure to do an update. I think the first thing to say in relation to the question is that this year has been one that you know started very strongly. You know, 2023 really kicked off with a lot of the momentum from Q4 2022 continuing to kind of run through really for the first couple of months of the year. And then ever since then, I think investors have become a little bit more sanguine and to some degree nervous around the pace of recovery in the Chinese economy and and why that's important for the resources sector is you know China's role in commodity markets is roughly 50% of consumption and so if you do have a slow moving chinese economy you know that has an impact on commodities demand and then more specifically where that kind of slowness was coming from in relation to commodity markets was uncertainty around the property sector, which, if you look at the data throughout the year, has been kind of trending lower. And I think there had been long-held views that China would embark upon a very supportive financial environment, both fiscally but also monetarily, in relation to the property market. And so investors who can remember the 2009-style kind of financial bazooka that China launched on the market might have been disappointed uh, in terms of what has happened this year. But when you dig a little bit deeper into what China's been doing, it's actually been targeting specific sectors of the economy where it's wanted to provide that financial support in order to sustain uh, and enhance the growth numbers. And many of those are related to the energy transition. So if you think about the moves around electric vehicles, around renewables and so on, which have had that support, those are very commodity materials intensive sectors. And so actually, Actually, when you look at the the net net impact on commodity markets, it's actually been pretty good. And you've seen that play out in other areas like the price of iron ore this year has been way ahead of expectations. So, you know, the price of iron ore recently was about 120 US dollars a ton. Investors have been expecting that based on forecasts at the start of the year to be towards $80 a ton. So a huge amount of additional revenue and profitability for the producers. So I'd say the first thing that's played out, which has been tougher for markets, has been that. The second, obviously, has been the interest rate environment. And I think it's fair to say that interest rates have gone to levels that were higher than anticipated. And I guess the language is now orientated more towards rates remaining at higher levels rather than seeing cuts take place. And so, again, I think that's created additional uncertainty. That's the kind of the macro view in terms of how things have played out. I think more specifically on the companies, we've seen ongoing impact of cost inflation, which has been pretty stubborn. We're seeing that actually roll out now. And so we would expect the cost basis of the sector to be lower in the second half of this year than in the first half, especially when it, when you think about some of the kind of drivers that have taken costs up uh, in that first part of the year. So I think if anything, that some of the, the profitability is going to start to come back for companies. So net net, you know, I think profitability wise for the company, Companies, they're definitely lower. Uh, payout ratios on dividends, obviously reflecting that. So dividends have been a bit lower as well. But we don't see any cause for concern in terms of our medium term view of, of investing in the sector throughout the cycle. Okay, well, that's the short term in a sense, and what's been happening this year. And we don't yet know, obviously, how that's going to play out. But if we take a step back, of course, it's interesting that um, you've been uh, involved in this trust, I think, for 30 years. You go right back to the beginning. I can just about remember when that was launched. And if you had told me that in the current environment, you would find the mining trust trading around par in a period when uh, we've had the whole sectors derated and a notoriously cyclical business, or what was a notoriously cyclical business, you know, I would have been very surprised. And I think perhaps it's, it's worth just mentioning the extent to which this industry and those who invested has changed so substantially over that period. I'm, I'm sure you'd agree with that. Absolutely. Over the last 30 years, this sector has been very cyclical, uh, as has always been the case. But what has enhanced that cyclicality, both to the upside in bull markets and the downside in bear markets, has been the capital allocation process and the businesses carrying large amounts of debt, overexpanding, overbuying things or paying too much for things in up cycles and then living to regret those decisions in the in the down cycles and, and then having to kind of recapitalize the businesses to deal with some of the debt. The sector today... Uh, 
And when I say today, what I really mean, you know, for the last kind of seven years or so has been carrying no debt. The capital allocation frameworks have been both robust and resilient. And we've seen that discipline continue to play out. And there's no change in that today. And I think that that is a significant reason, or well, those two factors are a significant reason as to why the sector is more investable and steadier than it has been in previous times. I'd say the last element uh, attached to that is that there is definitely a view held by um, people that the sector is going to be a major beneficiary of the energy transition when it comes to demand. And therefore, if you don't have that same downside potential because you don't have the debt, therefore the quality of the investment is higher and less risky, you are happier to wait that out. Any kind of short-term economic noise, like we mentioned earlier on in relation to China, you're happy to kind of wait that out because the downside is, is unlikely to be what it has been in previous cycles because of that absence of debt. And you're being paid whilst you wait in terms of the very, very healthy dividends. When we spoke in the autumn last year, I think, we talked about some of these issues. But you made the point then, uh, not only, obviously, the balance sheets of uh, mining companies are much better shape than they were. And the capital discipline is much greater than it was. Uh, we hope it stays that way. But you also made the point that valuations are very low at that point. What's happened since then? I mean, is it still the case that notwithstanding that view you just mentioned, that uh, investors don't seem yet to put a higher rating on these investments? I mean, the valuation I think you mentioned last year was this lowest since you started. Yeah, and I think in terms of multiples, it's actually a little bit lower today. So they're kind of back to the 1991 levels, which was prior to the launch of the trust. And that's in terms of multiples. You know, since we spoke last autumn, there's been a positive return for the trust in terms of a total number. The share price is a little bit higher than where we were last autumn, but we've had a very, very large large dividends over the, that, that kind of 12-month period. So all in all, it's been disappointing that we aren't dramatically higher and the multiples haven't expanded. I think what's holding back the multiples continues to be a lot of people who are focused on ESG and you know, the starting point on mining is that it's bad. And I think that there is an education process required from the industry as a whole and other groups to both show how important this sector is with regards to the transition because I think there's often complacency when it comes to the supply of minerals in the same way there's complacency around the supply of food and so on. And it's only, it only takes a disruption for people to realise how fragile the kind of supply chains are. And we certainly saw that in, in relation to COVID over the last few years. But I think that in materials in particular, we've got this very, very strong demand outlook and the sector is just not ready to meet that in terms of supply growth. And so I think there is an education process that needs to tell people the story about just how essential these businesses are for the kind of future improvements in living standards and, and energy transition for the world economy. Right. So there's obviously there is a kind of dynamic there, which is difficult because the point you're making, I think, is that demand for metals and, and other commodities is going to continue to grow and we're mm. going to need them for a long time. So it's more a question of persuading people that uh, the industry can actually change in the right direction while continuing to deliver the supply that the world needs. Would that be a, a fair summary? Absolutely. A very, very fair summary. And I think that the other point I'd make is that we can't continue to produce commodities in the same way that they've been produced for the last couple of hundred years. Because if the commodities that are being used today are being used for building green related infrastructure to support the energy transition, if the demand from that area is going to rise and we produce the, the commodities and materials in the same way, we're just going to be producing emissions attached to the production of those materials. So we actually need to decarbonize the supply chain of materials. And that's a really important initiative. You know, this whole idea of brown to green investing, you know, where you're investing businesses that are improving rather than excluding businesses because they have bad data is wrapped around this kind of transition related investing that's kind of becoming better understood, but still very much at a nascent stage. And I think that we, I would hope that kind of, people investing through a sustainability lens would make room to accommodate a greater component of businesses that are in transition rather than just excluding them because of backward looking data. So I suppose the question then is, if you're right about the supply and demand outlook from here, you know, are there enough incentives on those who are producing these commodities to actually change their ways? And what can you do as an investor to push them in that direction? Yeah, great question. So I think there's lots of incentives. I think the first one is that there's financial incentives, the cost of capital for green activities is lower than the cost of capital for non-green related activities. And you can see that in the price of green bonds and so on in the markets. The second point is that there is capital being made available for the transition, whether it's the European Green Deal, the US 
IRA, whether it's these incredible financial plans. I was actually in Japan recently hearing about their initiatives to decarbonize the Japanese economy. 1.4 trillion US dollars being spent between now and the end of the decade on that. And yeah, that's money being available for businesses to tap into to be able to invest in decarbonization related technologies for their own production basis. So there's financial incentives there. I think the third point is that you're able to charge differently for products that are produced in a green way way. So if you're producing carbon-free emission steel or copper or aluminium, it trades at a different price to the market price. Today, that's a premium to those market prices. But I think that price differential attached to how something is produced is going to be persistent and probably going to grow as the volumes that are available increase. You know, right now, if you're a large you know, automotive OEM uh, manufacturer, it's no good having you know a few hundred tons of materials produced carbon-free because you're not exactly going to be able to build all your vehicles you need. But when you can get a million tons of supply and so on, and then that's going to be able to satisfy proper amounts of production. And so I think some of the competition around customer choice is going to be driven not just in price, but also in how something is built. Uh, so the emissions footprint of a house that's being built or a car that's being constructed, etc. I think that's going to have a, a greater role in a final consumption decision. Does that make you optimistic that this is all going to come good? We're all going to be able to meet these net zero targets and so on that people talk about. The government seem to be a little bit in retreat on that. And there is some talk about ESG fatigue and all the rest of it. But you're confident this process will actually take place? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm extremely confident that the direction of travel is going to remain intact. I think that the speed of decline will be, you know, it won't be a straight line. There'll be periods where it stagnates and then drops and like a set of stairs. But I think the direction and the decline is, is, is very much there. I'm a glass half full kind of person. You know, I think we're going to have improved technologies, lower costs, efficiencies, etc. that are going to be able to deliver the changes that we need to be able to decarbonize in large parts of the global economy. So, yeah. I'm very confident around that. But, you know, if you said to me, will companies achieve their 2030 goals? I think some will, some won't. Some might miss it by a couple of years, but the direction is clear. Well, let's talk then a little bit about the trust and uh, its portfolio. What have you actually been doing in these uh, difficult, interesting times that we live in? (laughs) (laughs) Over the last 18 months or so, or two years, what have you been doing? What's been the main sort of focus of your change in your career? So we've continued to manage the trust in the same way that we've done for the last, you know, we're we're coming up for our 30-year anniversary in December 2023. And so we haven't had any kind of massive departures from style in terms of portfolio construction. We've made a number of investments in the private side that have actually done pretty well. Some of those private investments went public this year and uh, and last year, and the uplifts on those investments have been very, very substantial and have, and have really been a big contributor to the overall total return of the trust during that period. And so that's been a really active area for us. We've evaluated a lot more than we've invested in, as you would imagine. There's pretty high um, barriers or kind of restrictions in terms of what we're targeting there. So things really have to meet some pretty stringent criteria to get into the portfolio. So that's been a really interesting area and I'm very pleased about the the track record that we've built up there. In terms of the broader portfolio, it's really been a combination of a couple of things. You know, which commodities have we wanted to back over that period? And we've been kind of tilting the portfolio around between different commodities. Lithium has been a key one. We were very lucky, well, lucky stroke, hopefully skillful to be early in lithium. And, you know, we maintained some exposure and built that up. And that's been a key driver for most of the last kind of 18 months or so lost a bit of momentum this summer. And so we've been kind of moving around a bit between the companies there. There appears to be a lot of corporate activity. So the M&A is picking up in the lithium space. So you're seeing some kind of big consolidation start to play out in some of the kind of price weakness we've had this summer. Another area has been in uranium. And you might have an allergic reaction immediately as soon as I say uranium. But you know, as a commodity that is going to have an essential role in relation to the transition in providing baseload power, we all know when you look out of the window, the sun isn't always shining and the wind isn't always blowing. So it's all very well having renewables when things are working. But when they're not, it's really important to have that baseload power. And I think we're seeing a much higher period of demand for uranium coming through from uh, nuclear reactor power generation. And so there has been a renaissance in that space. And we've managed to pick up a pretty big exposure for the trust at a very advantageous point in relation to a capital raising from one of the the big companies. And uh, that's been a nice winner for us. In terms of some of the losers, 
it's important to cover those as well. We've had some kind of copper exploration companies that had performed very well. You know, some of the kind of froth attached to those. We didn't manage to take enough profits, I guess, in those areas. And so we've ridden things down, but now they're trading at levels that we were actively buying them at in the past. And the businesses have continued to grow and, and develop more and, and, and unlock potential value. So if anything, that kind of life cycle investing is presenting an interesting opportunity in a number of those names. In the meantime, you just mentioned earlier, you managed to uh, continue to pay a very healthy dividend. I think it's about 6.8% or something like that at the moment. And that's due to some of the portfolio change. You might remind us of the changes that really can't never guarantee a dividend, but uh, you're pretty confident that you'll be able to sustain and grow that dividend. Uh, yeah, no, so we, we have a dividend policy where it's not one that is linked to growth and, and so on. The board is very, very clear that they pay out and the language they use is substantially all of the income or revenue that the trust generates. And you know, for, I guess, the last more than a decade now, the board has, has done that. So I'm hopefully that track record is and people believe in it. You you know, so effectively, we pay out 95% or more of all of the income that comes in. And obviously, some of that income is differentiated. So we've got income from royalty investments and fixed income securities, you know, options trading. But the base load of the dividend comes from the ordinary dividends we receive on the large companies that we own in the portfolio. And those dividends are lower in 2023 than they were in 2022. And as I look into 2024, at these commodity prices and production rates, I would expect the dividend policies to continue and the payout ratios to hold. But you know, how much we receive will be a function of the underlying profitability of those businesses. And so we'll have to wait and see in that regard. But you know, absolutely, the dividend policy continues to be intact and that will not change. And so you know, our dividend will be a function of what we receive rather than a, a promise of necessarily growth. So there's an element of uncertainty about that driven by the market. Tell us about your gearing as well, because uh, you have been using gearing. I think you always have used gearing mm. to some extent in a range of between sort of zero and 25%, something like that, I think is the formal limit. Yeah, uh, so that's the formal limit. Um, we typically have a, a range between 10 and 15%. That's the number that we work within. If we get to a point where you know, there's obviously something that we need to finance, we can move around within that range. But we've been running between 10 to 15% for all of this year. Obviously, the cost of that gearing has gone up with interest rate rises. So we're very cognizant of that in terms of some of our strategies like um, fixed income arbitrage, you know, when interest rates were close to zero and we were getting eight or 9% or more on our fixed income securities, you know, that was wonderful. But obviously that gap has narrowed a bit. So the rising cost of debt has altered where we allocate some of the portfolio and we have to be uh, cognizant of those higher rates. But currently it's around what on average? The gearing, I think at the last release was around uh, 11 or 12%. Okay. So in terms of the debt, what you actually have, how do you actually uh, structure that gearing? We have two different types of access to capital. One is loans and the other one is an overdraft facility. The overdraft facility is a multi-year facility and the loans are done on a rolling uh, three to six month basis. And they've been provided for us for a very, very long time and we don't see any risk around access to that capital. But the cost is going up, of course. I mean, the cost is market related. Yeah. So the margin we pay over base rates is very, very small, much smaller than you pay on a mortgage or, or, or anything else, just because of our scale and ability to negotiate as BlackRock on behalf of the trust. But um, yeah, so it's a very, very small margin over, over base rates. Finally, uh, Evie, if I look go back to this conversation we had a, a year ago, you said it was, uh, well, I think you used the word very exciting outlook for the sector. You said it was an incredible outlook for the sector, linking the medium term. Obviously, the short term, we know it can go all over the place. You still have that uh, enthusiasm? I mean, obviously, portfolio managers are expected to be positive about what they do, better say, but uh, I was struck by the language you used uh, a year ago. You said medium, longer term. It really was an excellent prospect for your sectors. Uh, you still hold to that, do you? Absolutely. I stand by everything I said. My personal investment in the trust has continued to go up. So I'm backing my own views and belief in this regard. You know, when I look at that medium term outlook, the gap between supply and demand, it's very, very hard to see that closing. And therefore, that should present big opportunities for the incumbent companies. In terms of valuations, they are frustratingly low. And if you look at valuations, both in terms of multiples, the sector is trading below its own historic lows. In terms of the multiples today, it's trading at a big discount to market as well. 
Uh, when you look at replacement cost, the sector is trading way below the replacement cost for the assets that the world is so kind of dependent upon with regards to the energy transition, and I guess complacent about uh, in terms of taking the production for granted, despite some of the challenges that the assets continue to face around cost inflation, resource nationalism, the mature nature of many of the assets as well. So yeah, I, I remain exceedingly confident uh, about the prospects for the sector uh, over that medium term, but also very aware that in the short term, whether it's China economic data points or comments from the US Federal Reserve with regards to interest rates, all of those short term factors are going to create near term volatility. But I think as a long term investor, absolutely 100% committed and believe in, in the outlook. So that was uh, Evie Hamro, manager of the BlackRock World Mining Trust. Thank you for listening. The Moneymakers Weekly Investment Trust podcast is independently produced and edited and is listed on all leading podcast channels. You can also sign up at the website money-makers.co to be notified every time a new podcast is available. Please note these podcasts are provided for educational purposes only and nothing you have heard from any of the speakers should be regarded as constituting investment advice. If you want more news, analysis, interviews and other investment trust content, don't forget to look at the Moneymakers Circle, available now for a modest subscription at the website.